Um, so, Martin Rosen. I think it looks amazing. I think it's really good. Thank you. And um, before, just before we start, and before I start asking about the book, I just want to know if you can give us a little bit of background about yourself so I can. Right. Like, I know you used to do, do stuff for the star, we just said that on the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I used to do, um, I think for about three or four years I was regularly doing Saturday cartoon in the morning start actually but I just didn't have time I wasn't doing it on was Friday when I was also doing a Guardian cartoon how long ago was this? Uh, this was in the late 2000s so it was the end of um, New Labour and the beginning of the Coalition and then I just actually ran out of time uh, but as I said to you earlier on the morning star has managed to exploit my surplus value <laughs> very effectively and um no, I'm a big supporter of the Star, uh, not least of all because the Star is a big supporter of cartoons, and it will—it's got a wonderful record of taking on aspiring young cartoonists. Doesn't pay them, but what it will do is publish them, and I think that's very important because mm. the only way you can learn to be a cartoonist is if you're published. Mm. You can sit at home and do it all the time, like a cartooning Emily Dickinson that doesn't teach you how to do it. And then what? So what was it that got you into cartoons? Like, like um, way back when? Well, way back when, when I was ten, I wanted. Uh, I'd always drawn and I picked up my sister's school history textbook, the Illustrated History of Modern Britain, 1780 to 1945, which was illustrated throughout with Gilrays and Rowlandsons and Crookshanks and Tenniels and Lowe's and things like that. And I just thought, this is brilliant. Because I don't know why, from a very early age I was obsessed with politics. I was actually thinking about this. I grew up in the 60s when it was naturally assumed in the fallout from the satire boom of the early 60s that politicians were there to be laughed at because you had regular satire on the TV. You, you know, everything from that was the week that was mm. to, uh, you know, Mike Yarwood. It was just a matter of course that politicians were there to be laughed at, which I entirely endorse. I think it's a very, very good idea to laugh at. And so combining the two, combining my skill with drawing, which is just something I can do, um, and having read this book, I started, I went to my father's old desk and I found some steel nibs and I started trying to cross-hatch in the same way as Gilray mm. engraved or etched and uh, after that I did lots of uh, cartoons at school I got a very bad degree in English literature because I spent all my time doing cartoons for two-bit student newspapers <laughs> and six months after I graduated I got my first big break uh, with a series I submitted to the series I submitted to the New Statesman which was called Scenes from the Lives of the Great Socialists which was a series of excruciatingly bad puns based on the defining nostril of Marxist-Leninism, as you do. <laughs> and so that turned into a series, and then that turned into a book, and then I was um, signing on at the same time, and then suddenly I wasn't signing on because I went on holiday, and I was, then I was a professional cartoonist, and I have been for 36 years. You know, I've got away with it. And you've got away with it, yeah. I've got away with it. And um, so this book, you mentioned at the beginning of the book that you found... Well, you mentioned that you, the, the Communist Manifesto for you when you were 16 was mm. like like an eye-opening moment for you. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember how you described it, but do you still find it that way? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I still think it's a really interesting book. I found it completely explicable when I was 16. I just had no problem. It all made total sense. And now, doing the book, I was rereading it all the time, um, which is the way, the way I... I mean, this is my fourth graphic novel. I never storyboarded. I have the text and I start at the beginning and I work my way through until I get to the end because it's more interesting that way <coughs> and there were certain phrases when you've reread them 15 times some of Marx's paradoxes become completely impenetrable <laughs> Just, and there was one I can't remember what the sentence was there's one sentence luckily my wife's doing a postgraduate degree in philosophy at Birkbeck at the moment and I had to get her to explain to me what the sentence meant <laughs> and even though I didn't quite understand it but um at the core of it, at the core of Marx, Marx's Communist Manifesto, is you know the most important thing he says. It's not about dialectical materialism. It's not about this sort of subhegelian stuff. It's about describing human be beings being commodified. Yeah, that's the most important thing, and that's the less that's the message which I think um, is still relevant, it's still completely relevant because it's still applying, mm. which is why it's worth doing the book. Mm. And. When you were 16 at the time, what was happening? I mean, how did it happen such a revelation to you at 16? Because, I, I, like you said, I found it difficult. I still find it difficult to read it sometimes. I'm like, what is he saying here? And actually, I found your book because of the pictures. Mm. I'm quite into communist journalism and stuff like yeah. that. 
um, Joe Sacco I really like and his yeah. kind of thing and himself obviously mm. I find these kind of cartoons like so, such a brilliant way of explaining things I don't know why I mentioned that because I wanted to ask you about what you were like at 16 how did yeah. it get to you I was I was a, a sort of um, public school proto punk is what I was you know <laughs> like a lot of them like, uh, like Joe Strummer same thing um, public school proto punk and I've always I've had a lifelong obsession with the Soviet Union I think because my father was a scientist went to a lot of um, scientific conventions there when I was very small and it was this other place which you couldn't go to which was mysterious and strange what was happening there and I remember when I was about six in the garden helping my father garden I just remember him saying what do you mean you don't know who Karl Marx is you know, I, said, I know who Lenin is you know <laughs> And that's like I steeped in this stuff. He wasn't, he wasn't a member of the CP, he was just a sort of bit of a rebellious scientist. He, he, he found it interesting going there. Um, I was rather hoping at his funeral there'd be a thick set man where, with snow on his boots who would just leave a, a nameless wreath that would be his control for the Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the case. <laughs> so it was like a mysterious thing for me, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, the Soviet was a mysterious place. I went there when I was 17. I mean, it was um, during the Great Brezhnev stagnation. Uh, I don't think, um, I don't think it's the greatest advertisement for Marxism, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, uh, I don't think what's happened since is a particularly good advertisement for anything. But um, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you get interested in. I mean, I'm now, I've now, uh, uh, how many years? 45 years later, beyond when I first read it, uh, you know, I'm sort of being far more influenced by reading about anarchism, actually. Mm. Me too, actually. Yeah. They probably shouldn't go into that. Did, no, 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 not in the morning the start. Yeah. <laughs> Get back in the dustbin of history. Yeah. <laughs> but I do find that very interesting mm. myself, um, as well. Um, did it, so... I think you've already mentioned this, but I've got to be dad's on this kid. Did it when you when you read it at sixteen? Did it kind of change your outlook on the world? Do you think? Did it change? Um, yeah, or it, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it, it made me look at history differently, uh, and it made me because it, why it is the second best-selling book of all time? What's the first by the way? The Bible, uh, of course. Um, is because it contains a very simple and easily gettable idea about the nature of history that goes in ways, that goes in ways. And it's a materialist view of history that sort of makes sense. In fact, as he prophesied things, it didn't turn out like that at all. But it doesn't mean that it's not a correct analysis. Um, it didn't happen for all sorts of different reasons. Maybe because he pointed out what was going on and thought, oh, we better stop that. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll manage to get the false consciousness and all that shit we all know about. Um, and, and that was that was very important. But, but it was. Is there anything else? I also got various other things instantly. <coughs> that quite a lot of the book is is jokes, and it's been treated as a kind of sacred text. But in fact, the thing about Marx is he's very funny. I, I mean, if I recommend anybody to read his journalism, which uh, Engels got him this gig on a uh, New York newspaper, and he used to write this stuff. And Engels used to write half of it when Marx was having a fit of the boils or whatever. Um, but the stuff. Marx was writing about British politics in the 1850s is fantastic knockabout stuff and also really funny and this is full of really good gags so when I was first approached by Self Made Hero with the idea of doing it because uh, they previously reissued a graphic novel version I did of Tristram Shandy and I really liked Self Made Hero I wanted to work with them Emma phoned me up and said, what about the Communist Manifesto? And I got it in my head straight away, and that's how my mind works, that's how I do a graphic novel. You get the beginning and the end, you just fill in the bits over three or four months or however long it takes you. And it was the first part, just this sort of massive tectonic clash of classes and history and things like that, which, as it developed on the page, turned into this massive, cranking, kind of steampunk thing because I was determined I wasn't going to update it I was going to treat it as Marx and Engels said they were going to said it should be treated in this preface to the 17, 1872 German edition after it had been forgotten for 30 years they said this is a, an historical document so I thought okay I'll treat it as if it's 1848 so we'll have, we'll have steampunk why not let's have steampunk it makes it much more fun so that was that bit and this sort of building up to this massive crescendo um, and then you have the second part 
which, which in like a comedy club. Which right? which which I realised when I read it when I was sixteen is stand up because he because he has this series of questions and answers. And it's it's like you say, yeah, you bourgeois, you're knobbing your factory out and you're not knobbing your friends best friends' wives, yeah, a bunch of wankers. And then there's the third section which is yeah, you are the socialist. Well you think you're socialist, bunch of wankers. And then it's you know we have nothing to lose but our chains. Kaboom. And so it has a stru- it has a clear structure, and I thought, well, let's let's build on that. And I think actually the bit that works the best is in in my version is the comedy club bit mm. uh, because it actually emphasises that notion about commodification. So you have images of um, women who are just kind of a factory line producing little bourgeois. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you have factory hands who are turned into loons and things like that. Mm-hmm. There's a bit that struck me there is because they they kind of like the, the audience in there don't. They like keep denying what he's saying. They're know? heckling him all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can't see what they're doing, but at the same time, as they're like saying, well, the, "What are they doing?" They take this team that they're stealing people's stuff, mm. throwing them into this like, I can't remember, yeah, yeah. It's like a meat grinder. It's or a meat grinder. It's it's a surplus value <laughs> grinder. I think it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it was brilliant. Can you talk a bit about the end of the book? Because the way I thought it was quite it's quite interesting how you ended it, how you had like you know the bird shit mm. turned into stunt and mm. stuff like that. Of course, we can't treat the Communist Manifesto. Sorry, for the record, I've got a piece of jelly deal in my mouth there. <laughs> um, you mustn't be you mustn't be an uncritical friend of Marx. As I say in the preface, you can't blame Marx and Marxists. I mean, you can't blame blame them for Brendan O'Neill who would claim to have been schooled in Marxism, as indeed would Peter Hitchens, as indeed would um, various neocons, you know, so there's a Marxist diaspora of utter monsters out there. Um, but the Soviet Union uh, was not as Marx would have envisaged it. He had, as far as I believe, he just hated the exploitation of people and people not being treated decently that we should all be treated equally we should all be treated the same yeah. Leninism in practice was this hierarchical system but also dependent on using the bludgeon of the state um, and so I had to make some comment about the Soviet Union so you have in the book how Marx and Engels turn from they are posed as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid coming yeah. through a barricade so you've nothing to lose with your chains and then they turn into a statue and the statue gets covered in bird shit and the bird shit turns into Stalin and then the, when the bird shit's washed away it's a sort of lump of Brezhnev a, yeah that's great thanks thank you and the um, and the uh, statue is sort of falling to pieces and it's bulldozed out of the way by the, at the end of the Soviet Union and is replaced by these towers of the elite and then you have a financial crash yes. mm. Which is, I always knew I had to end it with the way it began, which is there is a spectre haunting you. Yeah, and I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. I really like it. To me, it was like the book is so dark. I want to ask you about that actually. Yeah. And I found like the imagery is so dark, but also like you know the words are really inspiring. Yeah. The imagery is so dark and it's just blood everywhere. Yeah. And then apart from the comedy, well, actually the comedy section is also a lot of blood in there as well. <laughs> but at the end, it's like comes right back to the beginning. And it's it's like, about revolutions, Ben. <laughs> How did you get the idea to have, it, you know, you've got, a, a, you start the book and you're showing like the different classes taking like concrete one another and they're always, they're on the top of like the backs of the working classes and yeah. just, or different, you know, people. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it started off with just how the strata of class, the class system emerged, which was only in the last five and a half thousand years anyway. So it starts with settlements and agriculture. And then it just builds up as a strata, so you get more and more people downtrodden with the elite on top of them. Um, and then, actually, I hope you thought it was funny because it's meant to be funny. There are bits. Of it was, I mean, the bit. My, my favourite first joke was um, when we get to the prefaces because there must be millions of people who thought, "Why have I got to read the preface to the Italian edition of 1881?" <laughs> 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 And so they're just, there's just a sort of mount, there's a kind of pyramid of prefaces that Marx is climbing over to escape from the German police um, before they go into the all history hitherto factory. And, um, and trying to get mental images of it, 
it's how my brain works and sort of thing. I thought, you know, I need to. So when he talks about, you know, um, the history of all hitherto existing societies, the history of class struggle, you need to, you need an image of that. You need the idea of revolutions. You need the idea, of, but also steampunk revolutions. And I got the um, what is it? The Acme dialecticalator um, <laughs> in my head, and it took me about a week to get that out on paper. And it's just these grinding, the grinding wheels of history. And they, there you are, then in a factory, and you just see how um, the class system and everything else is created by a mixture of molten iron and blood. And I thought that bit was brilliantly done because you know these people are going, they're coming out, and they come out like you know they've kind of been oppressed throughout yeah. history, and now they're on top. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I, I just I love that. I just thought it was so good. And then and then it's just using the words in the text, so it's re- reference to. Um, uh, even manufacture no longer sufficed there upon steam and machinery revolution industrial production the place of manufacture was taken by the giant modern industry so I thought okay let's have a giant called modern industries this is an enormous kind of giant who, um, who, who also shits and wanks and pisses and, things <laughs> like. um, <laughs> and what's wrong with that <laughs> I want to ask you Shley, how did you get this well you just added to that I guess but this uh, big Ben be the penis, I thought was really funny and really just such a, such a good depiction of what it was. But it like. is the executive of the modern status, but the committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. The words are Marxist, <laughs> the drawings are mine. He would have approved of this. <laughs> he would have approved. <laughs> yeah. I've never actually It's quite interesting actually because you also say at the beginning that you now you see Marx as being too authoritarian. I think I think it was just his temperament. People weren't listening to him. He got really cross, and so he said, "You know, I'm going to close down the first international. We're going to move to New York. I'm going to expel Bakunin. You know, you know all this kind of thing." Um, he was just a difficult old bugger, um, as he proved by his absolute refusal to get a proper job for 30 years while he's writing Das Kapital. Um, but he wouldn't have been Marx if he hadn't been. You see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But then again, he was a very good committee man because in the 1850s he was, in the 1860s he was just running committees for the uh, various socialist parties and then expelling people. You know, <laughs> was it ever thus? <laughs> yeah. What, what I find funny is, uh, you know, I've always considered myself as a socialist, like, yeah, probably for the last ten years, and I never really sort of started reading in depth about it properly and, mm. and you know researching it more and learning about anarchism as well yeah. and you know all the different forms and what I re- relatively recently I was reading about the first international and then the second the third fourth fifth and everyone's just falling out all the time and it's exactly the same still just all the time well I always thought that the, 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 the closest parallel with the first international was the uh, Council of Nicaea <laughs> What do you mean by that? Which was in 340 or something like that, which, which is, you know, it's like a religion. So they, that's when they expelled the Arians and, you know, the, the Arian heresy and sort of from Arius, the deacon Arius. Um, and it's just the way, if you have a, a belief system, or even any kind of organisation, you know, if you're a member of an of a amateur dramatic troupe, you probably have the vanity of small differences which will mean that you will expel people into outer darkness and never speak to them again because they brought you the wrong kind of biscuit it's just the way people act together they're constantly trying to get one over on each other um, yeah, my, 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 I think my, my beef with Marxism in as much as I've got one is it was because it was so brilliantly simple it lent itself to sim- not simplicity but simplification um, when things are slightly more complicated but um, but also that it was hierarchical, that Leninism was definitely hierarchical, it was, um, which is why you got Stalin. And you got, you know, a, kind of a society where you're trying to make people equal, where everybody is being told what to do all the time. And surely the human struggle for freedom uh, over the last uh, 5,000 years has been to stop getting people telling you what to do, but to agree together to do things together. You know, that's the point. So... So why did you decide? You mentioned earlier that Emma is it Emma from Self Made Here. Yeah, she's the founder, I think. Yeah, yeah, she? yeah. If she hadn't mentioned this to you, do you still think you would have done this, or what was it um, like? You know, that inspired you to do it? Well, that it was that, but and then realised, well, this is the book I should have done because um, I started doing a book for them about five years ago, which was 
um, going to be a graphic novel version of Francis Ween's biography of Marx. And I got my son, who just left the university and is, wants to be a filmmaker, I got him to write the script, because I thought that will just be easier rather than writing the script. And it took me about four months to do six pages, because there were too many people involved. And I'm a bit of a prima donna about these things. So there was Marx, there was Ween, there was my son, there was me, and I was the last one there. And I was just sort of drawing, and it was really boring. Um, but I felt Marx was unfinished business. And I had, in the, I had in the back of my head, I had this sort of desire to do a kind of um, a huge book that would just be, it would be without words. It would be just pictures of, the, of history and the Marxist dialectic moving on. Um, and I was thinking, how am I going to get that out? And then when Emma came along and said, you know, why don't you do the Cornish Manifesto? Yeah, why not? And then I could just use Marx's words. And these are all Marx. I think I've shifted around, two, I've shifted around the order of two sentences just to make the, the image make more sense. Um, but it doesn't take away from the meaning of the original. Um, I've obviously cut quite a lot of it, because otherwise it wouldn't fit it all in. But otherwise it's all Marx's words. As translated, obviously, with Engels' approval in, I think, 1882. Yeah. But it's all Marx's words. And, um, you know, I think they're still really good words. I think they make sense. They, they are moving. They're empowering, they're infuriating and much they make you furious and you want to go and do something which is one of the reasons for doing the book to help people understand it there have been previous uh, graphic versions of the Communist Manifesto there's one, a French one um, in the 1970s which was very French and it wasn't set out as a comic book it was the text with illustrations Right. Yeah. and there's currently an, a, a Canadian one where again, it's the they just set out the text and it's sort of illustrated in a very comic booky way. So it's it looks like Superman, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. Um, and there was never any point, as far as I'm concerned, in the, in the now four graphic novel adaptations I've done of doing it straight, because you might as well just read the original and stick with that. Mm. So if you have the giant of modern industry as this monstrous metal giant with a, a, a top hat with smoke coming out of it and a penis in the shape of Big Ben <laughs> wanking himself silly over the, over, the, um, <laughs> over the peasantry in order to uh, crush them as a class. Well, you know, I think that's uh, what we call in uh, Hegelian terms a synthesis. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about your work in general, actually, and especially in this book, is that it's kind of, a, you know, a lot of it's really dark. There's a lot of blood in here. Yeah. And, but it's quite funny, like, you know... Well, that's what we're called, because, well, joke, well, joke, joke, you know... The basic human sense of humour can be typified by this noise, which is the noise shit makes when it comes out of your body. And any child under the age of one, anywhere on earth, will laugh at that. Because if you didn't laugh at that, you would go mad with existentialist horror at the stuff pouring out of your body on a daily basis. And and that's what humour's about. Humour is laughing at the dark stuff. I mean, the, the imbecilic Peter Hitchens complained about the film The Death of Stalin, saying, well, how can you possibly laugh at these terrible crimes? Well, what else are you going to do? Of course you laugh at the terrible crimes. You laugh at death, you laugh at other people, you laugh at tyranny. You know, my, my whole career as a satirist is based on the notion yeah. of laughing at the crimes committed by these arseholes. Because when you laugh at them, it's all well said, every joke is a little revolution. That's a good quote. Yeah. yeah, I always, like, one of the things I think is so useful about comedy in general and satire mm. is that it does, it reminds you that these people are just people. You know, yeah. that it, you, like you said, the pooping sound or whatever, that kind of brings Well, it's, down. The, it's, the, it's, it's the wonderful Jewish gag, you know. He thinks he's better than you, he shits and he's going to die. And that's, you know, that's, that's true of Donald Trump and Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher and Karl Marx and Lenin and, you know, um, Kim Jong-un, everybody. They are just basically the same as you and me. They shit and they are going to die. <laughs> Which is why, I mean, I was having a, a bit of a ding-dong on Twitter this morning about... Um, conspiracy theorists because they believe in the omnipotence of sinister shadowy forces but there are no sinister shadowy forces they're just incompetent clowns like the rest of us yeah. <laughs> but they just think they're omnipotent and they're not, they're incompetent clowns the deep state is so comprehensively useless it's failed to stop the emergence of governments predicated on the idea there's a deep state <laughs> I mean, you know you'd have thought that'd be the first thing they'd stop them from doing you know shh, let's not let on about that <laughs> yeah I always think when people talk about conspiracies I'm like yeah but most of these people can't hide what they do with them they can't hide their affairs they can't hide what they do with them they can't yeah. really yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly exactly and also you know one of the 
greatest conspiracies of all time, which was formulated at the Weinstein Conference, which was the Holocaust, which is the final solution, was in response to a mythical conspiracy. Yeah. So the only people who actually peddle conspiracies are conspiracy theorists. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the digression there, but, it, but that was good. Yeah. yeah. We wanted to ask you, we talked about this on the way. Yeah. Um, these toilets, okay. these toilets with the, the tails on top of the head, you know, the cash machine. Yeah. I thought, I'm just kind of going through the book. I was trying to think, what does it mean? I know he's using these people and they're shitting them out. But well, they're the means of production. They are the means of production. It's, it's a way of, you know, because it's about money. As I said earlier on, is the, Marx's greatest achievement in the Communist Manifesto because he brought it to so many people's attention was the way that capitalism because capitalism is about making money that's all it is it's, all, it's, just a, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant way of wresting power from the landed bourgeoisie sorry the landed aristocracy by saying um, that, that money doesn't even exist it's about future money it's it's a kind of spiritualism so you know if you give me some money I'll give you some more money later on it's about something which hasn't happened yet and that's why capitalism is brilliant because it's, it's as Marx says everything to, is turned into air you know everything melts into air um, and it probably doesn't deliberately want to commodify us and reduce us to immiseration but it's, that's what it does because it has no choice it's a machine and so I wanted to get some way of suggesting, first of all, the making of money. It's just about making money. But, you know, the last uh, eight years in this country, Brexit, coalition, it's all just been about making, it's treating the country as a salvage operation, making more money for the already rich. And, um, but also the cost in human misery. So you have these toys who treat the people like shit and they're just constantly feeding them, pouring them down these toys and flushing them on the back of it. But their heads are toilets. And I discovered there's a First World War German cartoon of um, attacking the, the British government. And I think it's George V is shown with this toilet. And that is pure coincidence. Absolute pure coincidence. Um, that it was a toilet with a cash register system at the top. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never seen it before until somebody pointed it out to me after they'd seen this. Um, so, you know, always go for the obvious gag. I guess. <laughs> it may not seem obvious. When you think about it, it is obvious. And they're just great to draw. I mean, they're, they're, so then they're, they're these nice Victorian cash registers with beautiful engravings on them. Yeah. And then later on, after the fall of the Soviet Union, you get them, they have computer heads instead. Yeah, so, that's so, right. so, 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 and then they sort of explode and then they carry on and you know, here, but there they are. I like how, you know, you started off with like older computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah in the 1980s. In the yeah, and, um, and the bit, another bit I was really pleased with was how to on earth to deal with this third section where they're just bad-mouthing all the rival socialist organisations and it's just rock about fun. So I thought, God, transcribing all of that, it's not really going to get the reader very far. So I just turned it into Marx and Engels on this journey through the book. They then visit the socialist statue park, so you have all these different <laughs> yeah. statues of petty bourgeois socialism feudal and, and feudal socialism, which, um, to be very quiet, contains a representation of Seamus Milne in the middle of it, <laughs> who used to be my uh, editor on the comment desk of The Guardian. So oh, I thought, did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was looking, I was trying to, because I thought... Someone, I was well, it was Tony Blair, yeah. Tony Benn, Francis Ween down there, Tolstoy, um, Seamus, who has the has the coat of arms of Winchester College. Ben has the coat of arms of Viscount Stansgate. You know, so, I mean, <laughs> I'm not I'm not a big fan of Tony Ben. But, you know. Oh really? No. Why is that? Just as I'm saying, why is that? Uh, he was he was he was a kind of holy fool, which meant that he was irritatingly self-righteous. He was right about everything, even though he was demonstrably wrong. So it's not about it's not about uh, personality, it's about the issue, so I'm going to have to stand for the leadership of the Labour Party over and over and over again. <laughs> and also, uh, he used to be my late mother-in-law's boss. She was, oh, really? she was his secretary in the House of Commons, so she had to spend many unthanked hours in his basement in Holland Park transcribing his diaries and he'd bring down a cup of tea and a jam sandwich at three in the morning you'll be alright there won't you Mary Lou so he wasn't really paying much attention and years ago at the Labour Party conference I think about 2000 my friend John Cryer was meeting Ben I thought I'd say hello to Ben again 
and um, my mother-in-law's father was the documentary filmmaker Humphrey Jennings, my wife's grandfather, who made Listen to Britain and Fires for Scarf. And anyway, I saw Ben and I said, hello Tony, how are you? We met before my mother and Mary Lou Jennings. And Mary oh, Mary Lou, absolutely marvellous woman, lovely, lovely woman. You know, her father was his documentary filmmaker, extraordinary film she made. I said, you know what, I've been married to her daughter now for 15 years, I never knew that. No, it's absolutely true. And I thought, oh, Christ almighty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> occasionally you have to forget the politics, and if somebody's a dickhead, they're just a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've only got a couple more questions. Okay. Um, history. Like, you know, I, th- I think one of the things I took from this book and from the Communist Manifesto mm. and such is the, is the view of history and how it's, you know, it's just so bloody, it's just so horrible. And like, I think, particularly now in Brexit times, people have this totally bizarre and strange view of history this totally nostalgic view of history when if they actually were living in those times then well you know what I'd, if I was able to just stroke a spitfire I'd forget about having rickets <laughs> <laughs> do, you think people, do you think people have just this totally bizarre view yeah, of the past yeah they have a theme park view of the past it's uh, I mean it's, it's just dumb I mean I I occasionally get Stuff from, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I occasionally have stuff from, um, you know, my old college, my old school. And I just hate it. I hate the idea of looking back. I'm, I'm, obs- I'm very interested in history, but I'm always thinking about looking forward. But the idea of wallowing in the past. So I know people who think that their lives are more or less over at the age of 19 because the school days are the happiest days of their life. But that's it. Oh, Christ Almighty, if that's it. And so, um, you know, we, people say, oh, you must be uh, the most cynical person in life because you do these horrible drawings of politicians. No, I'm one of the most idealistic people I know, but I'm permanently disappointed. <laughs> but I'm also constantly thinking, well, you know, actually, it's not all getting worse. You know, who knows? And I've been almost insanely optimistic uh, because it seems so mad to be optimistic at the moment. But I think that it may be a busted flush. I think this, this sort of repulsive kind of emergence of... Neo-fascism, which is basically what it is, nationalism, fascist nationalism. And because they're so useless at it, they're so comprehensively crap. So all they can give us is Theresa May and Donald Trump. That you know, this idea that we are going to that there are people in America who seem to think that Donald Trump is genuinely the Messiah. He's just about to be exposed as being an incompetent gangster. And then maintaining that everybody else is evil and Donald Trump is blessed by Jesus going to look pretty dumb. And of course it'll be a conspiracy, you know, it's not really like that, it just did him down, it's the deep state doing him down and exposing the fact that he's a crook. He's obviously a crook, I mean, he's patently a crook, and he's a stupid crook as well. Um, and so I'm thinking, you know, well maybe we will get to the point where we will get rid of this shit. You know, this morning, 20th century Fox's offices were raided by the U- European Union. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And Rupert Murdoch, the greatest monster who ever lived, as we thought five years ago, said, yeah, that's fine, I'll cooperate. Because he's a busted flush, because he shits and he will die. And none of them are there forever. Uh, and so getting back to the conspiracy thing, this idea that these people are insurmountable, these people are indestructible, and we will always strain under their fatuous hegemony. No, we won't. Things will change, things will get better. And for the most part, for most people, you know, life, we live and laugh and love, and, you know, that's it. We have fun. There was something I wanted to ask, and I've just remembered now, you just said that. Yeah. Probably just answered this question. But the, you mentioned at the beginning that you found, like, that history has within itself the mechanisms for the working class to free themselves, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. You still think that Communist Manifesto has that? I think you basically just answered that question. Yeah, I think, I think I think if you read it properly, I think I think if you if you read it as an analysis rather than a prophecy, and you say and you think, well, that's what they're doing to us. They are treating us as a commodity. I think what I say is, hang on, let me just quote myself uh, if I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, what is it? It's saying um, his brilliant analyses. These include the materialist version of history and his vision of human beings reduced through exploitation and appropriation, what we call theft, to mere commodities, just meat machines existing solely to be milked for their surplus value, further to enrich the already rich. Yeah, I mean, if you recognise that, well, you, you're treating me in this zero hours contract, in this gig job, you're treating me like this. 
well, why the fuck should we put up with that any longer? Uh, that actually, there is no reason why we should put up with that any longer. That if somebody manages to cut through the crap, cut through the garbage that is surrounding us all the time, and say, yeah, okay, join a union, um, and cut through the crap, and no longer tolerate, you know, if you tolerate this, then your children will be next, to quote the defence of the Spanish Civil War. Um, and, you know, I still think that there are probably enough people with enough sense of justice to be empowered by that. I hope so, anyway. I may be being hopelessly naive, but actually they always say that, oh, you're just being so hopelessly naive and so hopelessly childish. Well, actually, you know what? There's nothing wrong with being childish. I'd rather like children. I don't like adolescents. <laughs> <laughs> And capitalism is adolescent. Oh, you can't, oh, you're not being serious enough. You know, always constantly told, why are you being so frivolous? Well, actually, because making uh, jokes and laughing is good, you know, to feel good, as opposed to being constantly serious and miserable. <laughs> and then, actually, I just continue with that. Um, I also still relish the irony that this compelling reading of history and human affairs as being almost geological in their tectonic clash of classes and thus being wholly impossible was promulgated by a couple of blokes down the pub. Which it was. And, you know, Marx and Engels were down the pub. They were down the Pindar and Wakefield. They were gone pub crawls through Soho. And they were talking about Hegel and they were making jokes about their socialist comrades who were, they were traducing massively and they were having a laugh. And there's no reason why you shouldn't laugh and, as Orwell said, have a revolution at the same time. That's brilliant. Is there anything, Mark, that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Um, don't think so. No, no. I think, I think that's, that's great. Coming out on the 2nd, is it? Of May or the 4th? Something like that, yeah. 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 May the 4th be with you. May the 4th be with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. I think, I think I've got everything. Brilliant. Yeah, that's, that's great. great. That's, that's great. great.